Hello, I'm Lily Hyam. And I'm Gordon Johnston. Welcome to the Last Question podcast, brought to you by the Data Lab, Scotland's innovation centre for data and AI, hosted by the University of Edinburgh. As always, like we always ask at the beginning of the show, if you are enjoying listening to us, please uh, rate us on whatever platform you listen to. It really helps. And we've seen a massive spike in listeners recently, which is very, very nice. So hello to all the new people out there. Today's guest is Marie Bajar, astrodynamicist, space environmentalist, and all-round space renaissance man. Mariba is an Associate Professor of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin, a Fellow at the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and a world-renowned expert in astrodynamics. Obviously, being a guest on The Last Question dwarfs all of those achievements, and he's also going to be at Data Summit this year. So, as always, keep an ear out for an exclusive 25% discount on your in-person and live live stream tickets uh, towards the end of the podcast. But before we dive into the interview... Lily, if you could launch anything into orbit, what would it be? First, I was thinking what I want to get off Earth, but then I thought, actually, what would I like to be out there so that if I ever am in orbit too, I don't know why that would happen, but maybe, um, there's something good for me and other people that are there, Um, like a pizza restaurant floating around in orbit. That would be cool. It might also be because out the window I can see a pizza restaurant, so that maybe gave me the idea. But also, um, I'm not going to name a pizza restaurant that I specifically want out there because I will only do so if we get free pizza. So this is an offer for a sponsorship Mm -hmm. deal. Yes. If you're a pizza restaurant and you want to give us free pizza in exchange for me saying I'd like to eat your pizza in space uh, and also suggest that maybe other astronauts would, Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I'm making a decision on there half there but i think if you offered an astronaut pizza in space would be delighted i remember yeah. when we spoke to catherine at nasa mm-hmm. um she was saying that one thing that astronauts complain all the time about is the food yeah so having a pizza in a pizza restaurant in orbit not just a pizza just one pizza no. in orbit well would it be preserved no i think it would freeze Fro- frozen pizza is fine you have to heat it first but... yeah but you don't have ovens on spaceships you could put it in the engine I feel like that would go from too frozen to too burned really quickly. Really quickly, yeah. yeah. There, there'll be like a nanosecond where it's perfectly cooked. Yeah, it's got to be quick. <laughs> just yank it out of there really quickly. Otherwise, it's really going to hurt the roof of your mouth. Yeah. Anyway, um, this is, as always, the high level of discourse you can expect from the last question. Mariba, thanks for joining us. What led you to becoming the world's first space environmentalist, and what is space environmentalism? No, thank you for that. Um, you know, when it comes to space environmentalism, really it's looking at the space environment like an ecosystem unto itself, just like we have land, we have ocean, I would say we have, you know, air and space. And even though, uh, you know, we don't have biological things, plants and birds living in outer space, um, I feel it's an ecosystem in the sense that it's a finite resource. Uh, we, you know, where we put satellites uh, is very specific, and we can run out of uh, places to put satellites, as it turns out. And yeah, I mean, the, the the population of stuff that resides in this orbital space are like different species. You know, you have. CubeSats, you have rocket bodies, you have dead satellites, you have all these sorts of things. So there, there are many analogies to draw from in terms of ecosystems and uh, you know near Earth orbital space. And because it's a finite resource, our collective behaviors are uh, exhausting it. And if we don't change our collective behaviors, then orbital space could become unusable. And so it's in need of environmental protection. So to me, space environmentalism is focused on near-Earth orbital space as an environment unto itself. Yeah, I mean, space junk's definitely you know, a massive problem. Uh, I mean, it was just this week that the US government fined uh, the DISH network $150,000 for failing to move a redundant satellite out of the way. Um, I mean, that's only going to keep happening. I mean, when you see those uh, graphics of how many satellites and how many bits of things there are in orbit, it's terrifying. Like, you think of space as being this big, open, empty thing, but then when you see how much crap we put up there, it's 
horrifying, really. It's like the ocean. We just find something big, then we pollute it. <laughs> yeah, so so I think, um, right, people say the ocean's big, and then look what we've done to the ocean with plastics, microplastics. People say space is big, and it's kind of the same thing. So the way, the way in which humanity explores uh, is always to the detriment of the environment. And space has been no different. But there are a lot of things that we can learn from how we've got it wrong with land and ocean that we could apply to space that we still have time to do that. Mm. I think um, space uh, people working in the space industry should know how much um, space we have to put things in orbit. But for people that aren't experts in space, how much like orbital space is there left? We can predict how many satellites might be put up, but how much space do we even have to fill? Yeah, so I, I think in terms of physical space, there is still a lot, just like the oceans are vast. Um, you know, we have many ships, but it's it's not like we're running out of ocean to put ships, right? So we're not running out of space to put uh, physical satellites. However, because we can't predict how these things are going to move or where they're at, and we can't track everything, that uncertainty is what leads to risk. Um, you know, because at least ships ships on the sea, we can kind of see where those things are at. If you're in the air and you're flying, um, two pilots kind of see each other. They can avoid hitting each other, right? A near, near air collision. Um, things in space are moving at very fast speeds and everything can't see each other until it's kind of too late. So that kind of complicates the problem. Mm, I wonder if we're going to be uh, generating some uh, AI tools to track and calculate the positions of all of these things. Um, probably doing some of these things on Earth already, right, with tracking uh, different things on Earth happening, and maybe they'll apply that similar things to space, keeping track of things. Yeah, so there are a lot of people already that, uh, you know, they have they have one hammer called AI, and so everything's a nail, right? So they're, they're basically they're, they're, they're a solution and look for a problem. And so a lot of AI people are taking their bucket of AI algorithms and just trying to apply it to space. But, you know, the thing about AI is that AI in and of itself is inherently stupid and dumb. And so the thing is, it's like AI assumes that tomorrow is going to look like today. So if you don't feed it a good version of today, then the prediction of tomorrow is going to suck big time. Mm -hmm. And so you got to feed it lots of todays. And the other thing about AI is that it assumes that whatever it is that you fed it is true. Uh, and so the thing is, and whatever it is that you fed it is sufficient. So the thing is, if the if the data that you feed AI is uh, you know biased and um, you know prejudiced and is incomplete and is flawed, then uh, you know and that's its training set. It's assuming that that's true and that that's complete and that it has everything it needs to make a prediction of tomorrow. So therein lies uh, you know one of the the things that people need to be very aware of when it comes to AI. But yeah, AI has merit uh, if it's applied uh, properly, for sure. Yeah, we often talk in the podcast and in the data lab about the quality of the data that you give an AI will completely determine the outcome. And that's why we're trying to make it more diverse and inclusive and equal and trustworthy, because otherwise it's just going to be like white guys in West the Western world with very distinct set of values that get to decide everything. And so far, haven't done a great job of that. You've uh, co-founded uh, the company's Privateer and Mariba Jai Universal, and they look at the approaches and tenets that indigenous communities have towards sustainability and the environments that humans interact with. Uh, can you tell us some of the traditional kind of ecological knowledge that can help us with our move into space and the way that we view and interact and treat this new environment? Absolutely. So here we go. Um, you know, for me, uh, so yes, my my... My motivation, my inspiration uh, is really looking at indigenous uh, people and, and their knowledge captured in the you know, TEK, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I think, you know, taking a step back, one of the things that to me is inarguable is that as a humanity, our collective decisions are leading us to self-extinction. Our collective decisions are leading us to self-extinction, and it doesn't have to be that way. And so 
for me, uh, when I connect to, let's call it the universe sort of thing, um, I see that there are pockets of humans that believe that all things are interconnected. They uh, accept that every day is a day of existential crisis that can be averted with attunement. So if, if, if they can have a successful conversation with the environment and they can attune to the environment, then they can be successful in averting that existential crisis. And that part of that attunement is grounded in being stewards and having responsibility over caretaking of the earth and the environment versus owners of things to like try to impose rights. And these are some of the principles and tenets that are captured in traditional ecological knowledge. And I think that by and large, Western civilization, as we call it, uh, does not believe that all things are interconnected. And in fact, tries to uh, basically say, hey, that, other, that thing that's happening in Africa, that's not my problem. This other thing, it's not my problem. People see themselves as independent. And because of that, it's just very easy to say, yeah, um, you know, good luck to you. You know, I'm going to be doing my thing over here. The other thing as well is that there's been an abandonment of this contract of stewardship with the earth and more of ownership of things. Uh, this is my land. This is my thing. This is my whatever. I have these rights. I claim these rights. Um, and as a consequence of that, uh, that there's also a detriment to the environment because that responsibility for the caretaking has been forgotten. So again, these are some principles and tenets of traditional ecological knowledge. And I feel that things are interconnected and I'd love to try to get humans to feel more reluctant to say, that's not my problem through providing evidence of the interconnectedness. And what I tell people is if you feel yourself to be completely independent is because you haven't seen long enough, you haven't seen far enough, you haven't seen deep enough. And if you extend that yardstick and those uh, dimensions, you will see that eventually everything is kind of interwoven with each other. And so this is where, you know, Lily, you brought up the AI thing. I think that machines, humans don't have the capability to comb through multi-dimensional data sets and, and find all these links between all these things. Um, there's more data and information than humans can consume. Um, this is where machines have to help sift and sort and that sort of thing. So I would love to use machines uh, to basically find these causal relationships across all these heterogeneous big data sets to show evidence of the interconnectedness so that people can be more reluctant to say, hey, you know, that's not my problem. And be able to then say, look, consider yourselves, if you can imagine yourself to be a steward, how would you behave? Um, consider that and hopefully try to recruit people's empathy towards uh, behaving in that way. So that's really my purpose through Morbidja Universal and, um, you know, Privateer is to find ways technologically uh, and through compelling storytelling and these sorts of things to achieve that. It's hard not to blame like commercialism and consumerism for a lot of this lack of stewardship. You know, the, the concept of ownership is so, it just feels so deeply ingrained in how we're brought up. You know, you have you have your things and then you grow up and you go to school so that you can get a good job so you can buy more things and it's all to do with just like carving out your little piece of the world and its resources and like jealously protecting them and when you look at societies that don't have that same model they are so much more well happy for one and also in tune with uh the earth and how things are naturally meant to be you know I'm, we're sitting in a big bright white office which is the most unnatural thing in the world, uh, in the middle of a city, which is pretty unnatural. It just feels like we've strayed so far. We've strayed so, so far away from any notion that we're... It's hard to feel empathetic with the world when a lot of the world looks like this. And this is a this is not by any manner means the worst place on earth. But yeah, I mean, to your point, I think the value, you know, what we value 
that's the thing that has shifted, right? And if value was placed instead of on things, on relationships, I think that that then starts beginning the shift. And what I mean by that is that um, how, you know, how we connect and to whom we connect to and with, if, you know, those things being our treasures, uh, being able to connect friends, family, you know, lovers, um, just people in our workplace kind of thing, uh, connect, you know, I spend, I, I try to spend 30 minutes every morning just listening to some, uh, music, you know, whether it's like Kenya or Deva Pramal or whatever, it's just something kind of soothing and light some incense and just remind myself that I'm just part of this whole experiment called life. And, you know, plants, trees, birds, m me, we're all on spaceship earth. We're all part of this experiment together. And I just try to value the relationships and the connection that I have and, and allow myself allow myself to feel some gratitude um, for being able to have, you know, I get to run, I get to breathe, I get to have some glasses of champagne. I also get to cry, I get to feel upset, I get to, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And um, it's an awesome thing. There's magic in every moment. And I think a lot of people focus on trying to have power through this idea of control. Um, and uh, I feel that power is not in controlling outcomes, but in the infinite capacity we have to make decisions. Every single instant, uh, every experience that I have allows me to make a decision and I get to make the decision and I can either be asleep and be reactive and allow people to guide my decisions while I just, cause it's, cause sometimes it's easy. Let somebody else decide for me let companies make decisions for me or whatever, or I can be a responsible steward and claim my own sovereignty and just be present in every moment possible and make intentional decisions. And so that's what I try to train myself to do. But I'm always working on it because it's really hard. And somehow to be able to train other people to shift where they feel their power into something like that rather than power over... Power over people, power over things. Also, great choice of music with Enya, by the way. Um, as a musician, Enya is my... Uh, she goals, basically, because she released a bunch of great albums, iconic songs, never plays live, and now she lives in a castle with her cats and doesn't speak to anybody. It's That's awesome, everything right? I've always wanted. Right? You know? So here's the thing. The, the thing that I think is so awesome about Enya that I think people don't know is that she probably is a lot richer than Beyonce and all these people put together. It's like just through these new age songs and this kind of angelic voice kind of stuff. Yeah. She, 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 yeah. She's like, yeah. Achieved so much more than many of the, yeah. The people, the rappers of this, that, or the other. So I think it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Orinoco flow is an absolute classic. I mean, if humanity ever does better than that, then I don't want to hear it. You know, that's... <laughs> There is, rightfully, thanks to advocates like you, much more awareness and emphasis being placed on ensuring the sustainability of space travel. Obviously, for decades, we've been striving towards semi-utopian technologies such as cold fusion, and we're both massive fans of the space elevator hypothesis. What do you think are the emerging technologies that will drive us closer to the goal of making space travel sustainable and less ecologically harmful? So one of the things that I'm definitely a proponent of are um, ideas of circularity and, and that come from waste management, right? And so circular economies are ones that prioritize prevention of pollution through first, reuse and recyclability, second, disposal, and uh, basically, for sure, not abandonment. And when it comes to reuse and recyclability, I am trying to basically try to convince governments to incentivize their industry to design, develop, and operate uh, reusable and recyclable rockets and satellites. So just like we try to minimize single-use items like uh, plastics, can we minimize single-use satellites and rockets? Elon has demonstrated this with rockets, but there are no 
uh, reusable, recyclable satellites. That doesn't exist. So I think um, developing a circular space economy would get us to spa achieving space environmentalism and sustainability uh, if we could have reusable and recyclable rockets and satellites. And for the for the satellites that need to be single use for lack of any, you know, um, then what does responsible disposal look like for those things versus just letting the things die and then like fall out of the sky and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, didn't they just find some massive piece of, um, a satellite in a beach in Australia, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, this is all, yeah. There's from the Indian PSLV launch vehicle system that washed up on shore. We're going to be seeing more and more things washing up. We're landing on places, um, for sure. If we don't change our behavior. It's lucky that the Earth is mostly ocean, because otherwise this would be just pelting down on residential areas. You know, it's it's a terrifying thought, really. Is there still some risk about that? Like, they can't completely predict where it's going to land, and that could actually be quite damaging, unless... Have they planned for these things? Yeah, Can they gonna, predict? It's going to kill people. School bus, car and school bus size objects will be coming to a home theater near you. That's, that's, that's what I say. So it's going to happen. God, am I, that, there's a tagline for the podcast. Um, it it really is just terrifying. Like, and also, I know Elon Musk divides opinion, but doing stuff like putting a roadster into space just is so irresponsible and stupid. It just really bothers me that at some point, it's either going to come crashing down to Earth and somebody's going to get murdered by a car from the sky, or it's going to crash onto a planet and we're littering, like astronomical littering. It's just really irritating. Yeah, so the littering thing is just going to continue. Um, you know, for for the roadster thing, I mean, um, you know, with with launchers, uh, one of the things that they do is they put a test mass on it, and as a part of the testing of launch vehicles, they do these sorts of things. So basically, there are uh, test masses currently orbiting the sun from previous launch vehicles, but Elon just decided to make his test mass the roadster. But still. Uh, it is, it is, there is a sort of arrogance, uh, you know, that goes with that, uh, especially if you're like a BMW fan or something, but no, I mean, um, but yeah, it is, it is literally uh, littering and, you know, we've already been doing this to other planets. The surface of the moon has all these like things from the Apollo era, including like bags of astronaut crap and stuff like that, like, like, like fe fecal matter and stuff, um, that were left there for somebody maybe, you know, that archaeological find, I guess. Um, and then, um, you know, even like the surface of Mars, you know, uh, if we, if we went to Mars right now, we'd find broken heat shields and, and parachutes flapping in the Martian wind. And cause that's the way we explore, we explore to the detriment of the environment and that's what we've been doing. So it's absolutely wild that, you know, maybe there's extraterrestrial life out there to get to Mars and go, my God, what happened to these people? Their parachutes failed, their heat shields failed. And they did know, a lot of poos. And they did a lot of poos everywhere. <laughs> you know? Oh, man. Yes, yes. Classic, classic humans. Uh, in fact, speaking of uh, Mars and, you know, extraterrestrial life and everything, uh, you've done a lot of work with uh, Mars exploration things. And um, obviously for decades, exobiologists have been debating, like, where we're likely to find life outside Earth. And Mars was flavor of the month for a while then the clouds of venus and the oceans of europa and now enceladus and also the james webb space telescope just found co2 in the atmosphere of a uh, k218b like that needs a way better name like you, they should put it out to the public vote although knowing the public they're kind of probably call it like plan planet mcplanet face or something mm -hmm. stupid like that yeah but, um, or, or if it's up to elon it's just going to be called x exactly mm -hmm. yeah and then it won't work and nobody will ever visit it again, and everyone's going to just long for when it was called K two eighteen B. Um, uh, so, like, where do you land on the debate? You know, obviously, thinking about alien life is always fun. You know, where do you think we're going to find it? Do you reckon we're on the cusp of discovering it, or are we still? Is that like a pipe dream? Yeah. So, um, I think for us as Homo sapiens, it's a pipe dream. I think the next uh, species of hominid we'll find it. And so the thing is, you know, we, we have evolved here on the earth with everything that we know, including a moon and all that. And when I see people focus on space exploration, it's all these, uh, 
and the sci-fi movies, right? It's all these like, um, it, where when we talk about Mars, we have these cities in like bubbles and crap like that. Mm. Um, that's just, we didn't grow up, we didn't grow up, we didn't develop in these very constrained environments. We didn't, we didn't develop as a species in like submarines and stuff like that. And so when we talk about the human experiment going elsewhere in the universe, unless somehow we can do it in a Noah's Ark fashion and transport plants and animals and all the things that we, because it's part of us. Humanity isn't just Homo sapiens. Humanity is everything else. It's the stuff that we should be stewarding back to the stewardship thing, right? It's the plants, it's the trees, it's the water. That's what we're used to. There's a, a connection with that. And, um, you know, I would, I would say that humans, when we say, oh, space exploration, uh, and envision it that way, I think that that is very much out of touch. I think it's not going to be obtained. Um, when people say, oh, well, you know, we can be on the space station for like a year and see what, uh, you know, free fall environments do to the body, which is bad, by the way. Like, um, you know, the, 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 the deterioration of the body, we haven't found a way to avoid that uh, in, in, in this free fall sort of environment. And um, the moon is something that you kind of look, look from the moon, you can see the earth. You can st still kind of look out the window and see the home planet. So it's not like humans have done the equivalent of what Polynesians did back in the day, which was, you know, get on an outrigger canoe and fully lose sight of land. So for, for native Hawaiians, when we talk about space exploration, they tend to, uh, the ones I've spoken to tend to look at it as, yeah, earth is an island and the universe is the ocean. We know how to do that sort of stuff, but it's not without its challenges. And I just think as a humanity, we're not ready for that. And so for me, the next species of hominid, just like Neanderthals and all that became extinct to me, homo sapiens, what we, we consider ourselves the pinnacle and, and the finality. I think homo sapiens will also become extinct. And I think the next species of hominid I call homo machina, which is the fusion of humans and AI and machines. And more and more of us are going to be incorporating machines in our bodies um, with time. And I think that this eventually uh, people like you and I that don't have the machinery inside will just die out through just naturally. And somehow the fused, uh, you know, human with machine, homo machina, will start to just reproduce and that sort of thing. And um You'll have different versions based on whatever, you know, operating system and upgrades and all these other stuff. But that species will be able to thrive in a place that's not like the Earth and will be able to travel interstellar distances and not like die in like a hundred years or whatever. So I think that's what it's going to come to. <clears throat> I do wonder what will happen with Homo Machina with things like... Um the gut biome, which we've been learning how important it is and how it's like your internal ecosystem is just as important as the external ecosystem and they interact with each other, whether, I don't think, I don't know, well, this is my limited mind, but I don't think we'll be able to make a machine to do the gut biome's work, but maybe we can make machines to create the external ecosystem to feed into the internal one. That's right. Yeah, you bet. Mm -hmm. It's like when humans go anywhere, we don't, we don't change ourselves to suit the new environment. We take our new, new environment. environment. We, we take, take our environment with us. Exactly. With us. You know, right. we have space suits. We have diving suits. We have all this kind of thing. We can't simply cannot survive anywhere that isn't completely attuned to our every need. That's right. Because it's we we didn't evolve in that, right? So yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. Like at you know Data Summit, Catherine Rayhill from NASA is going to be talking about the future of humanity in space with her human research and a. Uh, Paolo Benanti, the AI advisor to the Pope and uh, the Vatican, uh, he talks a lot about transhumanism and the kind of homo machina, almost eternal life. Um, That's right. It was it's exactly. fascinating stuff. He's, he was a really, really cool guy uh, to talk to on the yeah. podcast. In, you know, in, in fact, I've talked to uh, Brother Guy Consolmagno, who is the director of the Vatican Observatory, about you know space debris and space traffic and environmentalism. And you know he cares a lot about it. Um, he's very busy in other things, but uh, through him, I found out that there's like a pontifical academy of science. I didn't know that the Pope had his own academy of science. And so, um, yeah, it's funny enough, I told Brother Guy Consolmagno, I'd love to be a part of that pontifical academy of science. And 
uh, he was very kind. He, he he let me down easy. He's like, well, you know, we have like Nobel laureates and stuff as part of that. And it's okay. Well, out of my league, but uh, I don't know. One day it'd be pretty cool to be part of the Pontifical Academy of Science and see if uh, through that, what kind of research and things we could do to also help, you know, steward Spaceship Earth. Definitely. And also, you know, you're like on the ascent. Like, I'm sure in no time at all you're going to be a Nobel laureate and then the Pope's going to be coming to your door, you know, kicking your door down, wanting you to join this academy. Like it's pending. It's all pending. Okay, man. Well, you know, if, if, I, if I ever do win the Nobel Prize, it'll probably be, um, I'm not a physicist or anything like that. So the only option would probably be through, you know, peace. And I would love to, like, if, I was, if I was able to like win the Nobel Prize for peace, like that would be awesome. Only if like I actually did something that um, brought about real kind of peace and conflict resolution. I've seen some of these people win this stuff, and it's like, oh, I don't know that you really achieved the whole peace thing. But okay, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'd love to win a Nobel Prize in peace just so I can use it as a weapon against my enemies. You know, I feel like yeah. No, man. With that said, I think it might be time for some wild speculation. In each episode of The Last Question, we ask our guests to look beyond the scope of their research and speculate wildly about the future. Mariba, what do you think humanity's future in space will look like in 100 years? Maybe we should have gone more than 100 years for you, because I feel like you're thinking further than <laughs> yeah, the so, tiny 100 years. I know, 100 years is nothing in the great scheme of things, I guess. So uh, however far in the future you want to think, you know, how do you think humanity is going to look? Yeah, so so I think the way that humanity is going to look is uh, humanity as a species won't be around anymore. The, the next hominids will be around, like I said, and, and I called this uh, new species Homo Machina. And I do believe that, you know, machines are our future. And if we're afraid of them uh, or if we're negligent in how we develop a relationship, a connection with the machines then I think that um, the machines could very well be part of the extinction of Homo sapiens, um, you know, because I've already seen it already. And, and you know, people developing machines and saying, oh, well, they can't feel and they can't this and they can't that. I, for one, uh, try to have a relationship with machines that is founded in empathy. I think just because it's a machine doesn't mean that we should be absent of empathy uh, and compassion um, in dealing with machines. So I, I'm I, I'm fully into empathetic and compassionate connections with machines. And yes, I think that um, you know, 100 years from now, we'll see a very uh, stark contrast between humans as we know them now and what they'll be then uh, with a, a synthesis uh, between humans and machines that I, I'm calling Homo Machina. We'd like to thank Mariba Ja for joining us today for that really, really interesting look at uh, space exploration, uh, sustainability, and the stewardship of the Earth. All incredibly vital topics, you know, now more than ever. Uh, you can see Mariba in person at the 2023 edition of, the, of Data Summit, which is the Data Lab's flagship conference happening at the EICC in Edinburgh on the 2nd and 3rd of November 2023. And you, all of our wonderful listeners, can get an exclusive 25% off in-person and live stream tickets with the code DS23TLQ. That's all caps. So just head over to datafest.global for tickets and information. And we're really, really looking forward to that event. It's going to have lots of really cool people talking about fascinating stuff. In our last episode, uh, Disinformation in Warfare with Olga Tokariuk, we asked our listeners, do we live in a post-truth society? And we've had some really interesting feedback from that. We're going to read a response from Sara Spargaran, the program manager of the AI, Media and Democracy Lab at the University of Amsterdam. Sara said, Truth is still a very real thing, and people still value clear, verifiable facts. Yet in today's information overloaded world, distinguishing fact from fiction presents a big challenge. It's not just deliberate disinformation we should be wary of. With the global introduction of large language models such as ChatGPT, it falls upon tech and media organisations, regulators and ultimately news consumers to perform fact checks and prevent inadvertently disseminating misinformation themselves. Sarah continues, 
At the AI, Media and Democracy Lab, we look at the information ecosystem as a whole to determine the ethical and legal frameworks that need to be put in place to make sure that new technologies, whether purposely used to spread falsehoods or not, become a threat to democracy. Huge thanks to Sarah for lending her thoughts to this question. Uh, Sarah is also going to be at Data Summit uh, to participate in a panel discussion about AI, data and the future of democracy alongside Olga Tokabiuk and Trisha Govindasamy. Don't forget, you can join Data Summit online via our live streams, so check out datafest.global for all the details. And here we are, the last question. This is where we pose our listeners a question, and in a future episode, we'll discuss some of the most interesting answers. Our question this week is, what are the most exciting space exploration advancements we're going to see over the next 150 years? That's it from us today. We'll be back next time with more insight, innovation, and wild speculation. Uh, feel free to drop us an email, as always, to say hello or to suggest a topic or make corrections. You can reach us at datafest at thedatalab.com. If you enjoyed the podcast, please do leave a review on your platform of choice. It goes a long way and means a lot to us. Thanks for listening. Join us again next time for another episode of The Last Question. Goodbye. Goodbye.